So this is a picture of my Polisci 101. Um, the irony is that many of the tools I use are actually not part of C tools. It's but, not ironic, it's mm. fine. <laughs> but, but one of my defenses today is going to be that well, C tools is the, the sort of front line that the main interfaces students use. And one of the cool things about C tools is that you can sort of use it as a shell for lots of things. So I'll talk a little bit about that. So mainly I'll talk about interactive teaching. Uh, I also want to do things that are easily doable. I do a bunch of really wacky things, like I broadcast some of my lectures live uh, using my own computer and things like that. That's pretty techy and expensive and not so easy to do, so I'm not going to be talking about that. I'll talk about a couple of basic easy things. So Stephanie mentioned that the most denominations came from my 101. It's easy because when you have lots of students, <laughs> uh, it is that many nominate you. But so here's an example. Um, of my lecture room. In fact, what's now happened since I broadcast my lecture, there usually aren't that many people in the class that are watching from home. Uh, but no, you'll notice the laptops, which I encourage, they are using lecture tools, which I'll talk about in a moment. This is not a presentation of lecture tools, but it's one of the things I'll mention. So mainly I use it in this uh, large uh, intro political theory class. Uh, I also have used many other tools in my junior level uh, research, inter research design class, and then in my upper level political theory courses, which tend to be upper level writing courses. Um, so the, the variety of tools I've used in, in, in these different kinds of settings. So here's the humble old familiar C tools interface. Uh, again, I think it's very valuable right now that C tools, all the students know C tools. So I encourage uh, anybody who thinks about taking up their things to use C tools, C tools as a shell, and whatever the tools are, because that's what students are familiar with. So often I get, and uh, probably the the survey actually tracked people talking about tools that have nothing to do with C tools, but students just go to them through C tools. They in fact don't know what the other tool is because uh, you can sort of bury it nicely into C tools. So uh, I, I think that that's a really great. Thing that you can use C-Tools for. So most of the things, most of the tools are going to be accessible through this familiar menu bar. Uh, there are a couple of things that I won't talk about. I won't talk about my blog, but you'll notice that access to the course blog is through C-Tools uh, and things like that. What I will talk about are that this is actually a C-Tools feature chat room, uh, which I discovered in a couple of classes, students generated it themselves, um, organic, which I think is a great thing. Uh, and then I'll talk a little bit about uh, what I call reading questions and the tool behind that, and then a little bit about lecture tools. Uh, I'm a big fan of lecture tools. Again, this is mainly not about lecture tools, but I'll talk about it. The chat room is part of C tools. Uh, you can set it up. You can set up threaded conversations. It's hard to get students to use threaded conversations even when you encourage them to do it. Uh, and so what you see are various kinds of things. So what's cool about this, this is, this is both real-time chat and remains as an archive. What ended up happening is that there are substantive ways for students to engage during class, again, this is a class that's broadcast live, so they might be in the lecture room or they might be at home. This is not the only interaction tool they're using, but since, so they might have substantive questions. And here, the one full name is my GSI, who's actually answering them in real time. And students are talking about substantive issues, and also the static today is extremely bad. We had audio issues in Angel in my broadcast, so they were also complaining about that. So it's sort of a combination of substantive conversation and a reporting tool about difficulties students have. And what's cool is that, again, this gets archived for the entire semester, and what it becomes is a sort of a fact. And students ask one another questions. When I first started using this two years ago, I had chat office hours real-time chat office hours. Nobody ever used it during that hour. Uh, but they asked questions all the time, and I could see the questions, and I'd go answer them as soon as I could. But often somebody else jumped in first. Often it was a student. So this is a very cool, straightforward tool. Students are completely familiar with chat, lingo, standards, and so on. Uh, one could complain about some small aspects about the interface. Uh, 
uh, of this, but I think it's a very useful thing to do and think about using. So again, a couple of things that you can use it for. During class, substantive conversations, questions, fact for students in general. Uh, you could have office hours using that. Uh, so those are the three, three things I have been using it for. Um, the one thing that it didn't end up working so well, I tried to create a thread for group projects. Students also did group projects in this class. And their groups are organic, so they had to market their skills and find their partners. So I used that, I used the chat for that. I tried to set a separate thread for just basically marketplace of talent. They didn't quite know how to use that. Uh, so students are pretty good at negotiating some of these surface level tools, especially ones that they are familiar with, like chat. Uh, at the same time, there is this great myth about the tech savvy student. They are not very tech savvy beyond the surface tools, like chat, texting, and things like that, which is I encourage people to take advantage of, but you will also need to be ready to do some hand holding or guidance. So that's the first tool. I simply wanted to just flag, and it's very easy to set up. You just add it as a tool when you do go to uh, site info, and it sort of works automatically by itself. The other tool I wanted to talk about is, so I called it reading questions. So these were in this one-on-one -on -one class. It's for, uh, there are no exams in the class, and all the other com components are optional. So how do I make sure the students do the reading for every class, for every lecture, so 26 times a semester? Uh, students have to answer a couple of very quick questions about the reading. It's basically just a dumb police action to make sure that they do the readings. And what this, what you see here, student, this is all the students see if they, once they, um, this is closed since I did the screen grab yesterday, but there would be a continue button like any survey. And then it would go to a couple of very quick questions. Uh, one of the questions is how, hard, how difficult did you find the reading, which is something I constantly track. But one is a substantive, one or two are substantive questions about what, uh, you know, what was in the reading or something like that where I and the GSS can very quickly scan and see what's happening. And some of you might recognize what this actually is an interface for, and it's an interface for uh, unit lessons. So this is a very underappreciated tool. Uh, what I often do in my lecture with 250 students getting the reading questions, I just do the web interface report, and I look at are they getting it before the lecture. I'm just getting a sense like, whoa, they're completely uh, missing it or something. And it's amazing how quickly you can get a sense from not reading carefully from even 250 students where they're going. You can ask questions like, what would you want to talk about? Things like that. So that's a pretty cool uh, tool. You can just very easily embed it into C tools. Again, it is actually not part of C tools. It's at the moment run by just two people. And I just confirmed last week, it's still going to be around for another two years. Now, some of you might say, oh, I have a subscription to SurveyMonkey or Zoomerang or something like that. Nothing wrong in using those things. The general counsel doesn't generally like it when for protected data sits on some other server other than ours. That policy, I hope, will change down the line. But what's cool about this is that uh, your lessons is either anonymous or you can track students. Students can log with their unique names and you can track everybody carefully. And setting it up, again, as a survey tool, it's slightly clunky, but what I do is the, the regular reading questions I do is simply a couple of four questions, one of which changes every time. So I just have to change one question, then I, re, I copy the lesson and so on. And so it's, you, you can have access to it on lessons.umich.edu. And again, it's pretty straightforward. straightforward I just want to add that lessons can link to class roster. So if you use a tool like SurveyMonkey or one right. of the other ones, you have to download in some form or another all those student unique IDs. Right. So when I do anonymous surveys of students, what I in fact do is I create a separate lesson and you can set different kind of access. That's anonymous access. And then you worry, well, what if they're going to tell their entire frat house to do this survey? Well, you can embed it. Again, you can embed it into C-Tools so only that student can log into it. It takes a couple of steps for them to figure out what the actual URL is. 
They could do it if they really wanted to. I've never had a problem with that. So the final thing I want to talk about super quickly is lecture tools. Uh, I've been using lecture tools since version one. Uh, version three is actually coming out this summer, so what you'll see is um, not going to be the same in the fall. But lecture tools is now has a there's a way of connecting lecture tools directly <coughs> to your C tools. So it used to be um, separate. Now you can actually pull your class roster to it. A couple of simple steps to do it and. I imagine a lot of people are familiar with, with lecture tools. Some, I imagine many of you aren't. Uh, what the students see are my slides. What they can do is they can take their notes onto next to those slides. They can actually also draw onto them. Uh, they can, there's a bar you can see here. They can rate their confidence for themselves and as data for me down the line, their confidence with the material covered in that particular slide. And what I see in the aggregate is overall student understanding or confidence or comfort level with that tool. So there's, it's basically a note-taking tool. It keeps the data for the rest of the term. They can access to it, access it, uh, and, and so on. The other thing is that there are, there's lecture tools offers a real-time interaction with, with the instructor. <coughs> and the way this works is students ask a question. There's, it says here, ask a question. So they ask a question. Uh, they ask a question, I and the GSI see that question immediately. I'm, of course, lecturing and walking around, so I can't do any typing, but I walk around with my iPad and I actually monitor it in real time and refresh it every 14 seconds. Uh, and the GSIs can actually respond to it. So these are GSI responses. Once they respond to it, the entire class sees the answer. Um, and then finally, um, I, I teach sort of humanity stuff, even though I'm a social scientist, so it's pretty texty. So clickers are a dumb tool for me, so I, that's why I've never gone to clickers. I think it's a great tool, but not doesn't work for humanity style stuff. So lecture tools has this, what we might call a smart clicker. So here's an example. I create a timeline of important dates in the history of the United States, independence, constitution, civil war, uh, Gettysburg Address, civil war amendments, the 20th amendment, uh, Brown View Board, CRA, and I asked the students when did the United States become democratic, and on their computer, they place a dot, their mouse on that timeline, and what's interesting about this is that first of all, we tend to think our students are pretty jingoistic and patriotic, a lot of them think the U.S. hasn't become democratic yet, <laughs> but what this is really cool for is that it's not testing understanding, it's generating conversation, and it does it in a pretty powerful way, like wow. We have a wide variety of opinions on what the United States is, what the democracy, what democracy is, and so on. So those are the kinds of things that I have been using. How do I know it's effective? Well, there's a lot of a lot of this stuff, student responses, student logins, and things like that indicate to me that they are using it. In some classes, in 50 minute lecture, we had 150 questions during the lecture tools question tool. That was actually unmanageable, so we had to sort of discourage it. But so students are using it in ways that wasn't before. Is it effective? Well, certainly students are interacting with me much more than they were before in the 250 student class. Um, students report greater satisfaction. Uh, of course, that's not often correlated with learning, but I think it's also <laughs> important. Um, and my anecdata at this point, so I haven't been able to study this yet, is uh, student learning. I think that there are, there are clear evidence that students are learning more. And so what, am I still, what I still would like to see in C-Tools, um, and I think partly what Paul is going to be talking about is a partial answer to this, is a peer review tool. Um, when I taught at the University of Washington, 98 through 01, they had already developed online peer review tool, and ever since I've come here, every time I fill out the C-Tool survey, I ask for a peer review tool, and I've always been told, ain't gonna happen. So, but I keep asking. And in particular, I want a post-geographic peer review tool. I don't, want, I, want, I don't want students to have to be together necessarily, I want them to be able to do it online. So th that's one of the things I, I would like to 